Hello and welcome. My name is Brian Hansen, and I'm Vice President of Studies at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And I want to thank you all, especially our members, for joining us via Zoom today for this on-the-record conversation on the Federal Reserve's response to COVID-19. In light of the pandemic's deep impact on the U.S. and world economies, this issue is both timely and important. As a reminder, before we get going, the Council is a nonprofit, independent, nonpartisan platform, and the views expressed by the individuals we host are their own and do not represent the institutional positions or the views of the Council. In about 30 minutes or so, we're going to look forward to incorporating your questions in the discussion. And in order to ask a question or vote on a question that someone else has asked, please open your browser and go to ccga.live. Uh, in addition, you should know that a recording of this program will be available on our web website and on social channels shortly uh, after it's recorded, and we encourage you to share it widely with your network. Now let me turn to our program today and our speakers uh, for this webinar. I'm pleased to welcome Patrick Harker and Michael Dotsey to the, our conversation today. Patrick Harker is the 11th president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, a role he's had since 2005. And in that role, he participates on the Federal Open Market Committee, which formulates the nation's monetary policy. Also joining us for this conversation is Michael Dotsey. He is the executive vice president, director of research, and also director of consumer, the Consumer Finance Institute, of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. Welcome both, it's great to uh, have you here today. Uh, thanks so much for having us, Brian, and, and Michael and I are excited to be here with you in some form, in this case, a digital form. And just one minor correction, I've been at the Fed, the Philly Fed since 2015. Um, so, <laughs> thank you. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, speaking of the Fed, let me start uh, my remarks with the standard Fed disclaimer. The views I express today, and, I, and this, this also covers Mike, uh, the views we express today uh, are ours alone and do not reflect anybody else in the Federal Reserve System or on the Federal Open Market Committee. So let me begin. Uh, it's no secret that we find ourselves in the midst of a crisis like none of us have experienced in our lifetimes. The coronavirus that arrived on our shores just a few short months ago has killed as of today, 75,000 Americans. It's ended a years long streak of solid economic growth and caused tens of millions of our fellow citizens to lose their jobs. And it's really amazing to think how different my remarks would have been had I just given them a couple of months ago. The coronavirus is above all a public health crisis. And the Federal Reserve as an institution, and me personally and my whole team, Mike included, can't say enough to adequately convey our gratitude toward America's healthcare workers, as well as lots of other frontline workers, police, grocery store workers, truck drivers, innumerable others, including, for example, this morning on our NPR affiliate, they talked about death care workers, people who are taking care of those who are dying, who don't get much attention. They're all doing what they can to help individuals and the well-being of our country. So the economic ramifications of this crisis, of course, have been stark as well. Perhaps most notable has been a collapse in most forms of consumer spending. A component of GDP, as you know, that accounts for about 70% of our country's economic activity. In March, we experienced a literally unprecedented 7.5% fall in consumer spending and April data will surely be even worse. In the same month, manufacturing output fell to levels not seen since 2011. And data from the Institute for Supply Management showed a stark contraction in April as well. It's notable as well, as well that this diminution, particularly on the consumer side, was observable even before states took serious actions to curtail the spread of the virus. Now, to me, that strongly suggests that the coronavirus itself, and not just government policies designed to mitigate it, are the ones harming the economy. Before states and cities started imposing lockdowns and shutting down businesses that they deem non-essential, the data show that cutbacks in spending, things like airline bookings were collapsing, foot traffic in the restaurant, 
restaurants had already begun a steep decline, just to name a few examples of the weakening consumption demand in some categories of goods and services. Consumers were voting with their feet, or at least with their wallets. Now, even my presence here by Zoom is evidence that it, it isn't only government mandates that have slowed the economy. It was a decision we took ourselves, you took and we took, to stay home and to stay safe. The point I'm trying to make is this. Until the virus itself is under control, even as more states gradually open up, we can expect the economy to underperform relative to where it was well, just a few months ago. Does that mean, though, we should simply sit on our hands until effective therapies or a vaccine emerges? Of course not. As you probably know, our institution, the Federal Reserve, has taken bold action to help deal with the economic consequences of what is fundamentally a public health crisis. At the Federal Reserve, we have essentially found ourselves in the role of firefighter, and we've poured water on the fire. But we want to avoid damaging the underlying infrastructure of what it was just a few months ago, a very healthy economy. Our goal is to use our vast lending powers to maintain the underlying economic infrastructure by making sure that every sector of the economy has access to liquidity. Now, I realize that more needs to be done, that people and firms will need infusions of cash, and that all of this is occurring at a truly unprecedented pace. But that is a role for the federal government. Working together, we can try to ensure that the necessary conditions for recovery will be there when this health crisis has passed. So regarding the Federal Reserve actions, we have first and foremost acted by lowering our policy interest rate to near zero. And we expect to keep it there for some time. We've also taken a number of actions to keep credit flowing. Beginning in March, as the depths of the crisis became apparent, we started buying large amounts of treasury bonds and mortgage-backed securities to prevent credit markets from seizing up. Now, the markets have largely stabilized, and we've now slowed the rate of those purchases. We're also focusing on using our available tools to get loans directly into the hands of those who need them most. To do that, we're going to be buying bonds from cities and states, most of whose sales tax revenues have tanked, along with consumer spending. This program, called the Municipal Liquidity Facility, will provide essential liquidity to local governments as they fight the pandemic. We're also setting up what we're calling our Main Street Lending Facility. The goal here is to get cash in the hands of small to medium-sized businesses whose operations have been hampered by the virus. These businesses tend to be the economic lifeblood of their local communities. And the lending facility is designed to forestall mass closures of small and medium-sized businesses on main streets all across the country. Relatedly, the Federal Reserve is also bolstering the Small Business Administration's Paycheck Protection Program by supplying liquidity to financial institutions that are issuing loans to those crucial businesses. We know that this crisis is severely harming the nonprofit sector as well. Now, as a recovering academic and university president, I am acutely aware of the stress this crisis is inflicting on, for instance, the higher education sector. The Federal Reserve is thinking carefully about setting up facilities that can provide direct lending to colleges, universities, and nonprofit medical institutions. But I wanna be clear, we're not in 2009 anymore, and this is not quantitative easing 2.0. The principle behind quantitative easing was fundamentally that people weren't engaging in investments because the cost of capital is too high. That is simply not the case now. The reason people aren't engaging economically is the health crisis. I also wanna be clear that these facilities, as well as the actions that have been taken on the fiscal side, especially the CARES Act that Congress passed a few weeks ago, are not economic stimulus. Now, there may be a time for stimulus later, 
after the acute phase of the health crisis has passed. Our facilities instead are a form of emergency relief, or you could call it insurance. We're doing everything we can to help people get through a, an incredibly painful time. So now the 64,000 are perhaps the $22 trillion question. What happens economically? Well, the second quarter of data will be brutally painful as a result of both the virus and the government mandated economic shutdown. So you can take your pick of what that's gonna look like. It's gonna be bad, really bad, or really, really bad. But let's say it's going to be bad. What happens after that, to a large extent, depends on how the virus moves through our society and our reaction to it in terms of balancing stay-at-home policies versus an intelligent, and I want to stress an intelligent reopening. There are multiple scenarios as to how this plays out. But here are just two to consider. In a more optimistic scenario, the economy largely opens in June. We have the technology in place to contain the spread of the virus, and there is no second wave in the fall. In that scenario, I would expect a severe contraction in GDP in the second quarter, followed by a fairly significant rebound in the second half of this year. However, the second half rebound is not enough to fully offset the contraction in Q1 and Q2. 2021 would then show above trend annual GDP growth. That's the optimistic scenario. The less optimistic scenario is that we open too quickly and we see a significant second wave of the virus. Not only would this be a health catastrophe, but it would reverse the recovery as well. In this less hopeful scenario, I project a similar growth path to the baseline for 2020, followed by a very painful economic contraction of GDP in 2021 as the shutdowns are reintroduced. Now, longer term, of course, there will be a recovery, but I want to stress that it might be an uneven one. You know, there's this old saying that a rising tide lifts all boats, but I don't think that, that may not apply here. Manufacturers of durable goods, for instance, they should come back relatively quickly. For example, one large manufacturer in our district who temporarily halted operations, reports that the orders themselves, even though he halted operations, the orders themselves never evaporated. They were simply delayed as virus mitigation measures took effect. But as Pennsylvania and other industrial states slowly and intelligently reopened, I think we can expect manufacturing output to bounce back relatively quickly. Now, travel and tourism, on the other hand, may be in for a longer and more painful contraction. Businesses may have enough experience teleconferencing instead of holding physical meetings that they may decide to cut back on corporate travel. Families may choose to avoid crowded spots like amusement parks and cruise ships. The knock-on effects to airlines, hotels, and restaurants that cater to travelers could be severe and long-lasting. Commercial real estate could also suffer for similar reasons. Companies may find that working from home isn't so bad after all and reduce physical office space. There's also a strong possibility that many hotels and restaurants will never reopen. There will probably be retailers, big and small, as we've even seen today, that also shutter permanently. In the long term, the uneven recovery will present a risk to our banking sector which is heavily exposed to sectors like commercial real estate. The good news out of this is that we went into this crisis with a well-capitalized, <laughs> regulated financial system. But I wanna urge banks to retain capital as we prepare for a tough period. In my personal opinion, they probably shouldn't be issuing large dividends at this moment. They should be retaining capital. So, I'm a Jersey guy. I'm sitting here in South Jersey with you all right now across the river from Philadelphia. So I want to close by mentioning a subject near and dear to my heart, diners. <laughs> South Jersey's famous for diners. Near my house here in South Jersey, there's a diner just 
And just a few days after the restaurants were shut down here by the governor, the, these entrepreneurs quickly turned into a, into a full service grocery store. Now, perhaps this only demonstrates the ingenuity of South Jersey diners. And I admit, I am biased on that score. <laughs> but I also think it underlies Americans' boundless ability to adapt, to retool when times call for it. And I am sure because of that, that we are going to get through this eventually. Thanks, Brian. Well, terrific. Thank you for that really very big, um, if not um, uplifting, overview of where we are um, now. And I want to follow up on the description of the drivers of this crisis, which include, as you point out, pointed out right from the beginning, it's about the health phenomenon that has changed all kinds of behavior. There are also the shutdowns that are important, but there are multifaceted dimensions to what's going on here. In June, as you follow this crisis, and in June, you're gonna have your economic outlook. And I'm curious um, to get a sense of what are the factors that you think are most important to tell you how the economy is going? Because you've got some traditional measures like unemployment rates and all, but you also have disease spread, reoccurrence, right. kind of, how do you think about where the information you need is to understand what the economic effects are? Yeah, so let me start and I can turn it over to my colleague, Mike. Um, a lot of, we have lots of data. We look at lots of data. <laughs> that data tends to be backward looking. That is, it tells us what happened. Uh, so there's always a time lag. So increasingly, I'm looking more at survey data. We're conducting our own surveys, for example, the Philly Fed to try to understand what's happening with consumer through our Consumer Finance Institute, uh, what's happening with businesses and reaching out to companies, banks, individuals all across the region to try to get a sense of really what's happening on the ground. This is actually where, in my view, this decentralized central bank that makes up the Federal Reserve System actually has a real advantage here. We're out in the communities and we can get a real sense of what's going on. So I'm looking at that data, but fundamentally what you just said, what's going to drive this at the end of the day is how this virus moves through society, as I said earlier. I mean, and how we react to it, how consumers react to it. I mean, if the consumers don't have trust to walk into that store or that restaurant or get on that plane or get in a subway car to go to work, then we have a problem. So it's that human behavior, the psychology here that's going to drive this as well. And that we just have to, we have to do survey work trying to get an understanding of this. I'd like, just like to echo some of what Pat said. Um, you know, going and looking back at March's unemployment rate or GDP in the first quarter, that's not very um, worth, that doesn't provide much information. So I can just tell you a few of the things we've done and a lot of the other Federal Reserve banks are doing things similar. We have a monthly survey of a lot of financial institutions and consumers. We also have a survey that's pretty broad based on uh, manufacturing and non-manufacturing in the area. And then we have some econometricians who are using, you know, very high frequency data and um, to sort of like unemployment claims and things like that, to sort of try to get a weekly snapshot of what's going on with the GDP in each state. So it's, and, and we are reaching out a lot more to talk with contacts because they're seeing things on the ground. And even when we get this data, the normal models that we have calibrated or estimated to, they don't apply that well. So it makes it very, very uncertain. So we're just looking for all kinds of information. If anybody in the audience has high frequency data that they want to donate to us, we'd love to put it into, our, <laughs> into our forecast. Yeah, but Brian, let me give you one example, yeah, though, as the kind of data we get. So our monthly manufacturing business outlook survey is widely followed. Um, and yeah, the headline, the, the current activity uh, index fell pretty sharply, but the future activity index did not. And so both with the anecdote I mentioned of one manufacturer, that is replicated through the survey of people 
who don't feel like they're falling off a cliff right now when it comes to manufacturing, that it can rebound. That's helpful. Um, I want to, you did a terrific job of laying out the overall really incredibly aggressive and, and, um, and rapid response that the Fed has engaged in in order to respond to this crisis. And I'm curious, what do you, th how do you read the response so far in terms of um, liquidity in the markets, the stability of the markets, um, and also you talked about direct lending to, um, to new kinds of actors that the Fed traditionally hasn't uh, interacted with state and local governments and um, as well as small businesses and whatnot. And um, I'm curious where we are in that, in the rolling out of, of those programs. But first of all, kind of, is the liquidity operations, are they being successful? Are they achieving what you hope? Yeah, so what, there are various measures we can have of that, but fundamentally it comes down to are those markets functioning? Are we seeing the spreads come down? And the answer is generally yes. I mean, it varies by market. The one that mattered most to us and first was the treasury market, because if the treasury market doesn't function, none of the other markets function. Followed very quickly by the mortgage-backed security market, and then we started to chip away by putting facilities in place uh, to calm those markets. By and large, I think we've been successful at that. In terms of the lending facilities that are just a little uh, wonky point, under Section 13.3, they are under the purview of the Board of Governors, not the FOMC, so not in, in my case. And, of course, in conjunction with the Secretary of Treasury. Those two have started to have a real impact. I'm starting to hear this. Uh, and what we're starting to see is at least, for example, um, the payroll protection program liquidity facility. That is, the payroll protection program is a small business administration's program. But we are working with the financial institutions, in all these cases with the banks, the financial institutions. And we're able to provide extra liquidity by taking those PPP loans as collateral. We had a spike in demand. We're starting to see that it varies a little bit across the country, but we're starting to see that calm down some. And that's, again, I think that's a sign of it's working. People got what they needed to get through this period. You know, it's it's sort of that what, the way this is working is you want to use the pipes that you have to get the liquidity out to people. Right. And the Fed has well-functioning pipes and the banking system has well-functioning pipes. And so I think we're piggybacking on an existing infrastructure to try to get money out to people as quickly and as efficiently as we can. Yep. And as you think about the relative role of what the Fed can do in response to this crisis and, and what needs to be uh, managed uh, through fiscal policies, through tax and spending policies, uh, distribution of, of, of funds to consumers as we've had some of, I'm curious, what do you think the most important difference in that agenda is? And, and what should Congress and the president be thinking about in terms of the fiscal policies that best complement what you're doing at the Fed? Yeah, so first, let me start with what we did, sort of in a nutshell, what we learned uh, from the Great Recession. In this case, we acted decisively and very quickly. And, and we tried to make sure that these markets function. That is our fundamental role, mm -hmm. right? There's the monetary policy role where we dropped interest rates to essentially zero and with a commitment to keep them there for quite a while until we really see an economic rebound, but also just to create liquidity in the markets. We've done that. Mm -hmm. And there's some more we can do depending on those markets. Like I mentioned, nonprofits, eds and meds, uh, working with the Treasury Department under the Section 13.3 and the Board of Governors. But the rest, the fiscal stimulus, is obviously not in our hands. And there, that really is up to Congress and the administration to decide when and where uh, and how much uh, to add that, first, that relief. So, I, again, I don't even think it's stimulus right now, it's just relief. And then over time, as we start to come out of this, uh, to start to think about both Fiscal policies, uh, so obviously money flowing to the right places. Again, that's Congress's role, not ours. But also, uh, 
what that future of work is going to look like. Not all these jobs are going to come back, or they're not going to come back in the same way. I mean, people, you can think of retailing, right? Retail might look different now. So what kind of government programs are in place at the national and at the state and local level to help people make that transition uh, to those new jobs? We've always had that churn in our labor force. But in this case, it might be pretty dramatic. And so we're going to have to think about, again, that's not the Fed's role to do job training, we, but it is the role of the governments to think about how to get people back into jobs uh, and good jobs. So I would just, you know, I would shy away from, um, given where I work, uh, from making any particular recommendation to the fiscal authorities. But I just, so one underlying principle would be that we have to keep, as Pat said in his speech, um, organizational capital, social infrastructure, all those things have, we can't let that, we can't have mass bankruptcies or trying to get out of this will be, it will be impossible. Right. I just think things that shore up infrastructure are, are, uh, are the things we need to do and exactly how the Congress and the president are going to go about that, that, that that's their job. Yep. Terrific. One of the things that's been observed about this crisis is that much of the economic burden, the heaviest load of the economic burden, in many ways has been shouldered by lower income workers, yeah. people of color. Um, how do you think about that? And is in the Fed's toolkit, are there ways to be able to address those challenges? So our community development team uh, has launched a couple of years ago, something called the Economic Growth and Mobility Project, really focused on low to moderate income communities and trying to move them into the middle class. And so they've gotten, they've gotten a lot of work uh, on these topics. Recently, they re released three reports that I encourage uh, everyone to take a look at. One is who's being impacted by individual sort of demographics, uh, what businesses, small businesses are being impacted. And the last report, which will be coming out soon, is what neighborhoods are being impacted. And there is this uh, relationship between the neighborhoods, the individuals, and so forth. As we see, the neighborhoods that are high density, where people have a hard time socially distancing, are the ones that are having the largest incidence of the disease. And they tend to be the low-income communities. So there are these self-reinforcing mechanisms that are going on that we really need to try to understand and when the next problem hits us, once we get through this, we, the lesson, one of the lessons we need to learn is not let that happen again. And so this is where I think the work of the Fed is, again, as Mike said, this is not for us to decide how to do it. But I think the research we can do can shed light on what the issues are and what possible alternatives are to help deal with these issues. I have nothing to add. That's <laughs> okay. Good. Um, I'm interested in the in the question of global cooperation. One of the things that was noticeable in 2008 is that there was a mobilization at the global level, the gathering together of the G20, probably most notably, in order to coordinate policy response around the world. Um, one of the things that's striking, and, and it seems like almost every aspect of this current crisis, is that the responses have been focused very, very nationally. And there hasn't been the same degree of international cooperation operation, perhaps, that there was in 2008. I'm curious, from your perspective, and as you view this, um, does there need to be more um, coordination? And if so, what kind of coordination would be helpful um, in moving us through this crisis and, and on to recovery? So if you think about the, the Great Recession and the financial crisis, it unfolded, but at nowhere near the speed that this is unfolding, right? And so international institutions had time to gather, to talk through policy. This hit us very quickly. And so people had to react very quickly. Uh, that said, the leadership of the Fed has been engaged in conversations with others around the world. So I wouldn't say it's completely uncoordinated. Mm -hmm. But we had to do it in real time and where the clock was ticking very, very quickly. And so I think out of this, though, 
we need to learn some lessons. Uh, again, we, at least in the U.S., went into this with a well-regulated, well-capitalized financial sector, regulated financial sector. Mm -hmm. There may be questions over time, we'll see how this plays out, of the unregulated unreg sectors uh, across the world. But again, we have time to think about that. Um, and of course, there's outside our world, and I reemphasize my disclaimer at the beginning, because in my <laughs> remarks only, um, there clearly is a need for continued global cooperation around pandemics and global health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in the last one was basically a financial crisis, and there's all, already was an infrastructure set up through like the BIS and things like that, where people were already, you know, trading or thinking about right. regulation, um, you know, within a global context. Here, this thing just, like Pat said, it just hit us so fast. And everybody's economies are so different um, that I, I don't know what I could tell Germany on how to do stuff. <laughs> I'm, I have enough trouble trying to figure out what we should do here. So I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, bigger, it's a bigger ask. It's a bigger challenge. Yeah. Terrific. So I want to uh, kind of transitioning into questions. We've gotten a really robust and, and great set of questions coming in um, to ask you all. And uh, the most popular question, you won't be surprised, has to do with additional measures the Fed could take um, yeah. if there seemed warranted. Um, one of the ones that people are most interested in is negative interest rates. As you know, both in Europe and Japan, um, there has been use of negative interest rates as a policy tool. Um, and uh, it's something that hasn't happened here in the, in the United States yet. Um, is it something that is on the table as potential given circumstances? And what would make it more likely for the U.S. to move in that direction? So this is a long conversation. We, of course, have had a framework discussion at the Fed for over a year on what the future framework for our monetary policy uh, stance is. This has been discussed. Uh, that all I'll say is we've not made any decision on this, although the evidence is mixed that negative rates uh, do a lot. Let me add that then in this crisis. How would negative rates help? Just think practically. Mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden, a small business down the street, because the cost of capital for him would be zero for her, is suddenly going to go and reopen her business? No. The reason that businesses are struggling right now has nothing to do with the fundamental cost of capital. It is a health crisis. And so the idea that somehow pulling the monetary policy lever, in this case, negative rates, is going to have a measurable effect on the economy, I don't see what mechanism, what channel uh, that would work through at this point. So that can't be... Uh, the, the tool you want to use right now. Uh, whether we ever use it, I mean, it'll be a constant debate. I've ever heard, I've been on record saying I have a high hurdle before I'd ever consider using negative rates because, again, the evidence globally is somewhat mixed. I don't know, Mike, if you want to add anything to that. No, I, I, I totally agree with that. So uh, another question um, that uh, we have in the queue is uh, a question about. Um, about the potential for political backlash. Um, the Fed has, as you've pointed out, and I think all of us are appreciative of in many ways, has taken yeah. a really aggressive set of actions, including some unprecedented activities. Uh, one, of the, one of the great resources of the Fed and the, the ability to react like the Fed has is its independence, which of course yeah. is granted through legislation. And, um, and even after 20, 2008, there were questions about the appropriateness of some actions and all. You're in the midst of an emergency, and this is a this is a more long term kind of kind of concern. But how do you think about and and weigh? Um, do you have concerns about and, and and how do you think about kind of taking actions and the potential uh, for affecting the politics around the Fed's independence longer run? So let me reemphasize, Brian, what you just said. Fed independence is the bedrock of what we do and how we can move quickly uh, when the economy hits this unprecedented patch. 
uh, negative patch. So that is first and foremost in our mind. I don't, to, at this point, see anything we've done as threatening that independence. We knew what we were doing. The, you know, it's not going to be perfect. Nothing in life is perfect. But we have, are executing, I think, quite well on what we've agreed to and what we've agreed to also with the Secretary of the Treasury in terms of Section 13.3 authority. So, yeah, there'll probably be some you know, money, money, Monday morning quarterbacking about this, or always will be. But I think right now, what we've done, we've done for a very simple reason, as I said earlier, to bring liquidity back into the markets so that when the economy opens back up, it will, the recovery will happen as quickly as possible. I, I'm quite confident uh, that that will help. So I, I, you know, this goes all the way back to Walter Badgett and, and Lombard Street. But what yeah. we're doing now is central banking 101. We have got to make sure markets are functioning so that resources can be transferred from one person or one firm to another. Um, and that's that's just that we're the only uh, institution that can do that. And right. that if we don't do that, then we would lose our independence. Got it. Yep. Um, there's another question about a specific mechanism to see how you uh, see how you're thinking about that. And that is, do you agree with the Fed possibly purchasing junk bond and high yield bond uh, ETFs? So we at the Fed, because of our uh, corporate paper facility, uh, know going in that some of those will be downgraded. I mean, we, we by, uh, by law, are, can't go into anything knowingly losing money on it. That's, that's why, for example, in the CARES Act backstop through the Treasury of our lending facilities, it's very important that the Treasury has agreed to backstop our lending facilities and the losses. So that is not our intent to go into these markets. However, we know that as companies hit this very difficult period, they are going to be downgraded. And so we're going to have to know how to deal with that. That was the purpose all along. It was not necessarily to go into uh, those markets per se. Uh, Mike, if you know. Yeah, we're, we're not intending to go and just throw money at basket case companies, but through no fault of their own, some of these right. people are taking a real hit to, uh, on demand. I mean, consumer demand is down a lot. And we, like we said, we want the infrastructure to remain in place. So I think that's one of the things you have to sort of balance. So you look at a major auto manufacturer who's been downgraded to non-investment grade. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's a very good company. So we have to deal with that. Um, but I think the odds are high that they will recover from this over time. Okay. Uh, one of the questions that's come in um, says that you've sketched two possible pathways for the U.S. economy, one of growth, if the virus can be contained, and the second one, which is an even more severe recession, a severe recession in 2021. From where you sit and what you're observing, um, is reopening happening too fast? And which scenario for the U.S. GDP do you see is more likely? So it really varies by the country. I mean, where we are sitting in North, the Northeast, uh, things, the, the seven states have agreed to coordinate in terms of their behavior. Uh, we are opening very slowly. And so I, I think that approach makes sense to me. Uh, that we move a little bit, see how we do, move a little bit more, see how we do, and take our time. Instead of just rushing, uh, because that could create this second wave. As we've seen, and this is not just theoretical, we've seen this in other countries. I mean, the countries that have done this well have had medical technology in place and a careful, methodical approach to opening up that seems to be the way to mitigate the, the risks of having that second wave. And so, again, this will vary across the country, um, but I think, to me, that's, that, that's the approach that makes the most sense, because we don't know exactly what's gonna happen. So, 
you know, I think of often if you're running in a dark room, bad idea. You should walk up to the wall in the dark room and feel feel where it is uh, before you just run smack into it. So let's just take our time, open uh, carefully, methodically, open to things that make sense to open first, where you can socially distance the easiest, and then keep chipping away at this. Yeah, I agree with that. Terrific. We've got a question which is uh, looking at the longer run effect of the actions being taken now. Um, and it really is talking about the, the pouring of liquidity into the, into the economy, um, the fiscal policy, um, and, and putting you know, trillions of dollars in the economy by the U.S. Uh, government, increasing the debt um, significantly. And the question is, um, how should we think about um, how should we think about the policy agenda for longer run response and and, and longer run um, uh, managing of what is in the process of being created in the context of this uh, of this pandemic and this emergency? So obviously, we're adding in a crisis a lot to the deficit and debt. Uh, on purpose. We're doing this knowing that we have to do this to get through this period. But, you know, we go into this in a relatively good spot. Uh, in 2019, U.S., uh, the United States spent 1.8 percent of GDP on debt service. A lot of that is due to low rates. Uh, mm -hmm. So while the deficits and debt are high, they can be managed over time. But let me emphasize, and this is not the role of the Fed, they have to be managed over time. I mean, it should not be just, we just run, run wild with this. So I think as we go through this, and the best analogy I can think of is the Second World War, right? We ran up a big deficit because we had a crisis. I mean, this crisis is very large too. But over time, a combination of economic growth, uh, helped and helped us deal with that deficit over time. But again, it has to be something that's managed by the fiscal side of the house. Yeah, I would just echo it's a physical problem, but it, from an economist standpoint, it makes perfect sense. You have, say, two states of the world, one where you have a virus and one where you don't. You want to bring money from the states of the world where you don't have a virus and resources to the state of the world where you have the virus and you can't right. work at full potential. And you do that by borrowing. Yep. So on the, there's another question which is about learning from other countries and the extent to which the lessons and experiences of other countries are useful for the Fed. Certainly there's been a lot of talk on disease management of who's done it well, what can be, what can be learned for that, from that. But in terms of, of financial policies, in terms of the Fed's uh, approach, um, are there things that can be learned from countries that are further ahead? Are, is there a conversation going on uh, at that level to try to understand what those lessons might be? So we're constantly talking to our colleagues around the world at all levels, not just at the senior levels of the Fed, but uh, research teams, and, and Mike can uh, talk about this uh, across uh, the globe. Uh, at this point, I think it's a little too early to tell. I mean, what we've done is different than uh, some other authorities. Uh, and so I think there'll, there'll be time to, to look back and see what worked and what didn't. Uh, but I think it's too early to tell in my mind. Yeah. All right. Terrific. Um, I think one of the other um, one of the other questions um, that exists um, here is: Do you feel that the Fed has the tools that it needs and has the authorities that it currently needs in order to continue to respond to this crisis? Um, or are you feeling that there needs to be any kind of legislative action now to be able to open up new things um, that the Fed can do that might not be possible, it might not be possible now? So I want to go back to uh, your earlier question about Fed independence and uh, also um, something I've said in speeches ever since I've been here. Uh, 
the Fed can do a lot, but we can't do everything. We know with our congressional mandate, what is our role? And our role is not fiscal policy. It's not labor policy. It's not, you can go down the list, right? Health policy. So we, and I, I think that's appropriate for the central bank. We are the regulator and we are the monetary policy uh, authority. Full stop. The rest of government at the state and at the federal level have to take on these other issues. Um, I just don't think it's appropriate for us to continue to sort of add to our authority uh, in a way that moves us away from our fundamental role in American society. Yeah, we're just not the right institution for that. That has to be voted on by people. It has to right. go through their representatives as we have a representative democracy. And for big types of programs where big money is being thrown at stuff, that should not be a central bank's function. That's right. the role of our elected representatives and the, the, um, the executive branch. Yep. So, um, Pat Harker and Mike Dotsey, I want to thank you so much for uh, being on and help us understand what the Fed is doing. Um, I wish you all the best to stay healthy and um, with you much too. wisdom as you guide um, our economy forward through this really um, difficult time. Thank Thanks, you. Brian.